Well, God designed us to be in community. And if you can remember in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, when you read about um, God sends Moses and they, he rescues the enslaved people from Egypt. And then with, following this series of miracles, they go to Mount Sinai and they're waiting there at Mount Sinai. And Moses comes down the mountain and he's been speaking with God and he has the Ten Commandments. And he gives the commandments to the people. And lots of people think, like if you ask the question, what are those commandments for? Um, it's common for people, churchy people, people in the community to think that those commandments are the way to get to heaven. If you can just simply do enough good things, it's like a trade-off. You're sort of making your way to heaven with your good behavior. That, of course, is um, not what the Bible teaches that the purpose of the commandments is. The commandments are just what's right. And um, the way to heaven is through a friendship with Jesus and accepting his death on the cross. And what was that death for? Well, God knows that we've all broken the commandments and we're all sinners. We've all made mistakes and God is... He said, look, you can't get yourselves out of the mess. I'll get you out of the mess for you. So he dies on the cross and he, he lived a perfect life and it's like his life in exchange for ours. Like he was a ransom payment to exchange. It was his perfect life in exchange for our broken life. Um, so we, the, the commandments certainly have a purpose in telling us right and wrong. Um, but they also have another purpose that's beyond just simply the concept of an arbitrary list of things to do or not to do. It's act, God says, I'm going to give you these commandments because I want to make you into a people. What's he talking about there? He's saying, I, you're a motley crew of people who've been slave, enslaved for 400 years and I'm making a people out of you, a nation that's going to work. And so he says, so here's the principles of loving relationships, essentially, for working together and being a community together. And anywhere where people have disconnected from God, the source of love, community starts to break down. And when we go back to his commandments and reconnect with Jesus, not just the commandments alone, but definitely the commandments through a relationship with Jesus in the context of knowing God as our Lord and Saviour, those commandments become a special fabric that um, makes our community and that shows us how to work well together. And thousands of years later, God comes as a human being this time. And he's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and in Luke, chapter 6, <coughs> you read this story of Jesus going up onto a mountain, praying all night, coming down, appointing 12 disciples as his followers, and sharing this famous Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is reminiscent of Moses going up on the mountain. And he doesn't wipe away the commandments from Moses, he, ex he expands them. And where Moses said, don't kill, Jesus said, well, don't even think a hateful thought towards someone, and so on and so forth. And so Jesus is expanding on these principles and when you read the Beatitudes and you read the, the Sermon on the Mount, it's easy to, to miss the point that God is, Jesus is teaching people how to be a good community. And next time you read through Matthew chapter 5 or Luke chapter 6 where it's recorded there, I want you to think about what you're reading there, all those different recipes for what's the right and wrong way to live in life, is really teaching us how to be a community together talks about um, you know, not hating one another, forgiving one another, being faithful in your relationships, and all these principles. They're really principles for how to be a loving and healthy community. And Jesus is still trying to make a community out of us today, 2,000 years later, here at Walls End Church. He's building a community. And Walls End Church is a 116, 17-year-old community. And so no one's that old here. So it's evolved throughout the years. And I believe that if you can find a place that is reflecting, that's loving, that is uh, reflecting an emphasis on a relationship with Jesus and following his commands and creating that network of community, that's a beautiful thing that God has always wanted you to be a part of. And God says... Um, in his word, that his plan for us is to have friendships and to be loving and kind to one another. 
And um, the funny thing about life, though, is we seem to always have disagreements and fights with each other. And that's just, it's like there's something in the water, there's something in the air where we just get annoyed with one another. We do it in our marriages, we do it in our, with our brothers and sisters growing up, we do it at work, we even do it at church. And this is reality of life. And so God's got all these backup plans in mind for how to work with the realities of the ups and downs of our relationships. And that's what he he gives us these principles in his word. But the thing that he wants us to do as Christians is not just love him, but love one another. And in fact, he says in his word, this is how that people will know that you're my disciples. What's the thing? How you love one another, that you love one another. And I just find that really challenging because it's, Jesus says, it's easy to love someone who loves you. Anyone can do that. He says, even sinners do that. But he says, if you want to really do something that's Christ-like, how about loving your enemies? And um, that's where you need a miracle. That's where God comes in. Um, But God's plan for us is to unite together and we'll fulfill our purpose in life, not when we're on our own, but when we're in community. He's making a people out of us. And so God's got a plan for your life. And it involves church. It involves being part of a church community. Whether you're a visitor today and you're part of a church community elsewhere, or whether this is your home church, the point is God wants you to be with other believers, connecting. And um, God, God gives us this principle of togetherness for getting through life. One of my favorite scriptures, it's often used talking about marriage, but it's actually just talking about any relationship. It's Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12. And um, it says, If two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And verse 12, And though one may be overpowered, two can resist. Moreover, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In the... um, in, in, in the Ray household at present, there's excitement because we've gotten two kittens and um, I've been holding back the tide for as long as possible, but I've lost. And um, we've, we've had enough um, things to clean up over the last nine years without kittens, but um, here they are. And I do, I do love animals. My resistance and reluctance is purely practical rather than emotional and um, happy to have these kittens and we've had them for three weeks before we've settled on their names, Charlie and Django and they're twin, uh, well they're from the same litter, they're they're brothers and um, at present we're just keeping them in the house doing the kitty litter tray and all this but eventually we'll let them out and um, I remember when we put them in the house the first night, Jess and I, was we put them in the back veranda section and we're worried that it's going to be too cold. I said, they'll be right. They've got each other. And they've got these fleecy warm coats. They'll be just fine. And they're still alive three weeks later. How about that? (laughs) And so, um, but but it is a real thing. You will see them tackling each other and fighting each other. But when they go to sleep, they sleep on each other. And it's like they just love each other and that they're best friends. And then they'll wake up and start fighting again and chasing each other around the house. And it's, it's lovely to have them in their home. But, you know, God has designed us for it to be in community. And we have our moments, but when we're together, we're stronger. Now, I need a couple of volunteers. I'm looking for some primary school age volunteers who are feeling particularly strong today. Looking for some strong volunteers. Who's, who's going to put up their hand? Okay, Link, you better come on up. And over there, come on up. Yes, you. All right. Yeah. Boys, one of you come up. Quick. You had your hands up a second ago. Does anyone else want to come up? I need another boy. Uh, One over where? Okay, excellent. Okay, now, what have we got here? Tell me your name again. Caleb. Caleb, excellent. All right, this is a bit of a mess. Hopefully this works out. Okay, got some gloves here. Put a pair of gloves on each. Okay, I've got some string. Now we're going to do an experiment. See if the Bible is telling the truth about this. I've got some different strings here, and we made up these at our house this morning. 
This one's got two strands. All right, once you've got those gloves on, you're going to stand there and try and rip this cord apart. And Jess said, after I'd planned this all, that this might not work because just one string is actually already made up of three strings, she told me. So anyway, let's see how it goes. So when you're ready, wrap that around your hand a few times. Grab on nice and tight. Do you reckon you've got a good grip? OK, Link. You get this end, wrap it around a few times. Have you got a good grip? All right, now you boys need to snap the string. So stand across from each other, give it a big pull, see if you can snap it. Did it break? Yep. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, wait there. That was one. Now, let's. how hard was that? Not very hard. Not hard? All right, how about we try again? OK. Tell me your name again. Caleb. All right, Caleb, give it a big pull. Link, go for it. Wow, they did it again. All right, two. How hard was that? A bit harder. Do you reckon it was harder? Could you tell the difference? Yeah. All right, a bit harder. All right, this is three. Have you got it? You can use two hands if you want. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wrap that around. Come forward a bit so you can... Link's, Link's ready for action. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, give it your best shot, guys. <laughs> Hang on. You've got to work as a team. <laughs> Are they going to do it? Lean back. He's ripped it out of his hand, but I'm not sure if that broke. Do you think it broke? No. Didn't break. Well, there you go. The Bible's telling the truth. Let's give the boys a round of applause. <laughs> you guys did really well. If you want to take those gloves off. The Bible says a cord of three strands isn't easily broken. Did your fingers survive that? I hope so. Let's give them another clap as they go back to their seats. All right. Strings four and five didn't even get used. Wow, how about that? You know, when we're going through life, if we're on our own and we hit a hard time, sickness, relationship struggles, difficulties at work, whatever it is, it's pretty rough when you're on your own. And I remember, you know, life, um, when you're a kid, you're not usually on your own, but I remember traveling on my own for the first time. Raise your hand if you've ever done travel on your own. It's a bit of a weird feeling when you set out on your own for the first time, isn't it? And um, I remember feeling excited and enjoying it, but I also remember thinking every time I saw something awesome, I wanted to tell, talk with a friend about it. Did you find that? And you think, I want to share this discovery with someone. Another thing that we, we want to share, have you ever listened to a great new song and you just think, this is fantastic, I love this song. And then, so what do you do? You get a friend and you say, listen to this new song. And it's even better when you find a friend who also likes the song, right? And God has decided that it's best for us to be in community. And God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's been in a community for eternity. He knows it's good for us. And when you're going through a tough time, it's great to have a friend. Um, and even better to have two friends. And um, Jesus encourages us to be a friend. Um, you know, research tells us that friends make you healthy. Let me share a few studies with you. Here's, there was lots to choose from online, but here's, here's six different studies. Um, 2011 research study on fourth graders showed that those who had friends, um, having friends helped fourth graders cope with stress and rejection from other friends. So kids in primary school were researched, and those who had friends um, if one of their friends pushed them away, having a couple of other friends really made a difference. And you might think, well, that's obvious, isn't it? Um, and I think it is. Um, but research has proved that somebody did their PhD on that. What do you know? And so um, here's another interesting one. Friends make hills seem less steep. Have you heard this research study before? So what they did, not just metaphorically, uh, so it's... It's from the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Participants, participants estimated a hill to be less steep when they were accompanied by a friend than when they were alone. Isn't that interesting? What's more, the longer the friends knew each other, the less steep the in incline seemed. Isn't that awesome? When you're walking up and 
steep hill with an old friend just doesn't seem so steep. And God designed us to have friends. It was his idea. Um, third study, friends help you battle cancer. We've prob- you've probably heard stuff like this before. 2005 study, women with ovarian cancer lo- who had lots of friends um, recovered much better when they're going through chemo. And that reminds me of the... Um, the Blue Zone study that was in National Geographic that looked at three communities with people around the world who lived to 100 years of age, centenarians they call them, and that Seventh-day Adventists were recognised globally as a group of people who live longer and healthier than most people on the planet. And one of the themes that all three communities had, the Adventists, the Okinawians from Japan and the Sardinians from Italy, they all had good friendships. And church was the place that provided that in the Seventh Adventist context. And people had relationships and a sense of belonging. And that was important in all of these studies that showed long life. (coughs) All right, number four. Loneliness and a weak social circle. Um, And I found this one shocking. Um, Pulling research from about... It was like a meta-study from pulling research from about 150 other studies showed that loneliness and a weak social circle is as bad for your health as about smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. That's what this research showed. And like that just, I just think, nah, it can't be that bad. But <laughs> that's what this project showed. And so that's pretty bad that it, um, being on your own would have such a... Not living alone is the issue, but having no one in your life is really unhealthy. Um, Good friends lower your blood pressure, number five. And number six, if you've got good supportive friends, you're 20% more likely to stick to your goals. They'll help you whether you're trying to, um, you know, do something new or stop doing something. Some supportive friends will help you 20%, which is great. And, you know, this is science just really backing up what God's word has said for thousands of years. And it's amazing to recognise that. I want to look at um, God's plan for us to be a people. And in the Bible, God uses four different metaphors for the church. And the church, of course, is not a building. It's the people that make it up. And um, that's us. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you don't look like a church. Can you do that right now? And then you can say, thank you. I didn't think I did. But you, and now you can tell them, but you are the church. You are the church. And so a church in the Bible is God's people, disciple of Jesus, working together in their pursuit of love for him and sharing his love with one another and the community around us. And the Bible gives us these four beautiful metaphors that I want to share with you today and have a look at. And so the first one is that um, you are a brick in God's temple. That's the first one, you're a brick in God's temple. The next one is you're a part in God's body. And the third one is you're a fruit on a plant that is the, the church. And the fourth one is, you're a family, uh, you're a member in a family. You're a member in a family. So you're a brick, you're a body part, you're a fruit, you're a member of the family. All right. So let's, what is God trying to tell us with these things? Let's look at the first one. You're a brick in God's temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you all know that all of you together are the temple of God? And God is um, putting us together to make something special that reflects him. When you are a temple, uh, when you're a brick in that temple, you have this sense that I belong. And some people come along to church, but they haven't made a commitment yet. They're kind of like in the attendee zone, but they're not involved. They slip in and slip out, and uh, and God is longing for you to make a decision. You're probably here because you've committed to Christ, but God is asking you, Jesus, the one you've committed to, is saying, I want you to be committed to to my, uh, my temple, my body, my plant. I want you to commit to the church, not just me. And God is saying to each one of us, don't go it alone. In fact, your purpose in life can't be filled if you're isolated. Thanks. And so, um, we, God, you know, 
is encouraging us to push through because no doubt there's reasons why we don't want to connect, but God is saying it's worth it. It's worth it. There's blessings and purpose and intentions that God has for you that can't be done without other people. God is wanting to move us from just having a peripheral connection to God's community to be committed to one another. And so I want to encourage you, if you're here today and you kind of know that that's you, that God's calling you to increase your commitment, I want to encourage you to do that. And some simple ways to do that is obviously be here regularly, but there's different things that we have. With such a big church, it's hard to know everybody, practically impossible at the size we are right now. And I want to encourage you to get into a small group or get into a Sabbath school or get involved in a ministry. Um, these are the places where you're going to meet 5, 10, 15 people and you'll be able to experience a lot of the important dynamics of what church life is all about. And um, <clears throat> if you're, we've got parts of our church that are strong because people do exactly that. We've got people who... They've gone through all kinds of things, but they've survived because their Sabbath school group has taken care of them. And some of our Sabbath school groups really look after each other, and I love it. We've got some long-going small groups as well, and they look after each other. And we've got um, people who have run ministry together for years, and they look out for each other. And these are easy ways to get on board and connect. And um, sometimes you go to a group and you think, these people look weird. I don't know if I want to be their friends. They talk different to me. They dress different to me. They're a different age to me. They seem to have different, um, different social things to me. And I want to talk about how God breaks through social hierarchies. One of the amazing things, if you read about it in there, in the in Luke chapter 6, when it's talking about, um, it says, Blessed are the people who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the poor, because they'll become rich. And it says, But woe to those who are wealthy, and woe to those who mock others, woe to those um, who are popular. And what are these blessings and woes about? If you look at it at face value, it would be easy to read and just say, Is Jesus saying that let's be a community that is poor? mourning all the time, and unpopular. Who wants to join? Um, Is that what he's saying? What he's really saying is, you're blessed when you're in those positions. And he says, but those who are um, wealthy and abuse it, those who are mocking and laughing at others, and those who are popular, and that that's all they're living for, that's all they've That's all they're going to get in this life, and that's all there is to it. What God is saying is, if you follow him, he... God takes a sledgehammer to the social ladder and social hierarchy model that runs common communities. And so in a lot of communities, if you're rich, it means power. And if you're, it says, woe to those, um, one of the other woes was um, pleasures of life and um, the comforts. and, And another one was being popular or being adored by everyone. And so these things being rich, powerful, having all the comforts, having a nice house, beautiful cars, having um, everybody like you. God says, if that's what you're living for, watch out for that. And he says, um, he said, besides, while those things are good, he said, in the long run, they don't really matter. You can't take it with you to heaven. And he says, what, and if, what the problem is with this hierarchy model is if you are powerful or you are um, popular or whatever, it's just too easy to look at people who are not powerful or popular or whatever and think, I'm better than you. I'm above you. I'm superior to you. And God is saying to people who don't have that, which is really 80% of the world, right? He's saying, you're just as good as anybody else. And he's taking a truck and just ramming it through society's ladder of who's important and who's not. And he's saying, you're all important. And don't get sucked into this worldview of some are better than others. And what I've noticed in church is, it's a place where church is being healthy. It's a place where you've got people rubbing shoulders with each other who would never normally rub shoulders in the rest of society. It's a miracle. You've got people who are highly educated rubbing shoulders with people with no education. 
can't even read. You've got people who are extremely wealthy rubbing shoulders with people who are extremely poor. And they know that they're not looking up and down at each other, but they're looking across at one another as equals. And that's Jesus' style. Because he says, you're all my children. And he says, and he doesn't judge us on this same ladder. He's got a completely different way of assessing how we're doing in life. He's very interested in how we go with what we've got. And what's our heart doing? Do we have a soft heart toward God and other people or do we have a hard heart toward God and other people? These are the kinds of things that God is interested in. And God is wanting to see a community where we understand that, that those worldly status things, they are temporary and that every person is valuable. And where it doesn't matter what age you are, where you come from, what your background is, you are valuable just as much as the person next to you. And that happens in God's church. A brick in God's temple is just as valuable as the next brick. What about a part of the body? Well, this is one we've talked about many times before. Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 says um, that there's many parts to a body, and so it is with Christ's body, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. So that I can't say to the foot, I don't need you, and the ear can't say to the nose, I don't need you, and the hand can't say to the leg, I don't need you. We all need each other. And some of us are being reserved in our involvement in Christian life, and God is calling us to say, we're missing out. If you've got a jigsaw puzzle and you've lost one piece, and you finish it, and someone comes up and has a look, what's the first thing they look at? Where's that bit? And some of you are the missing jigsaw puzzle piece. God is calling you to make that commitment and show up to make the picture beautiful. And um, we, we as a church are like, you know, having one half a leg and a stump here and one eye shut. And um, until we all participate and, and do our thing, we will miss out on it. And some of us might think to ourselves, I'm just a little toe. I don't make any difference. But... Who here wants to have their little toe chopped off? I don't want mine chopped off. And I think it does make a difference. And you know, we might say, well, that person's, um, that person's clearly important. They're up the front talking all the time or whatever. And God says, you've got it all wrong. Every single one of you makes a difference. And if, you, uh, if one of you is holding back, it's just not going to be healthy. It's not going to be the plan that he has in mind. You know, um, Sometimes community is what is lacking to help us move forward in life. And some of us are wanting to change and grow. How many times have you wanted to change and grow, but you just lacked the support network that would help you to be able to pull it off? And God is saying when the church is being everything it can be, that support network is going to appear and you'll be there for one another with the ups and downs of life and um, you'll be there to help each other move forward. Um, sometimes we're disappointed with church, and maybe you've been disappointed with church for a long time, and I want to encourage you to continue to be patient and persevere, because as bad as church can be, and sometimes it is bad, um, you think, why didn't that person befriend me? Or, um, I, you know, bad things can happen in church. You can be taken for granted as... in. And it's because we're all humans. I'm not saying that it's okay. Um, I'm saying it's bad. Um, but there's no perfect church out there. And God is saying, as tough as it is, that's where you're going to learn to grow in that kind of community where you're committed to Christ and you're committed to one another. Some of the growth in life will only happen in an environment of commitment because it's just too easy to just say, I'm just going to disappear from that relationship. I'll just move on to another group. But then you never grow because you keep just dodging it. And so you'll have the same relationship challenges in the next group and then in the next group. And God is saying, be committed to one another and then you'll grow through those processes. And sometimes that's hard. And it's like going to the gym. The real growth happens when the muscles start hurting. And that's when I generally like to stop and think, okay, I've been to the gym. But God's saying, no. That's where the growth is. And so sometimes God allows all difficulties. Um, he, may, he may not cause it, but he certainly can turn it into a blessing by helping us grow in hard times. We need one another to learn real love. If you're on your own, you can't love because love is a community activity. 
And so God is calling us to be a body together. What about the fruit on the vine? Um, John 15 verse 5, Jesus says, and there's lots, of, there's lots of metaphors of a plant, the church being a plant that grows, but here's one. Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you stay connected, everybody say connected. If you stay connected to me and I'm connected to you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. God is saying, if you're apart from Christ and his church, you're just going to miss out on your purpose in life. And, you know, wither up and be like a raisin instead of a grape. And who here knows that that's just not as nice? Some people love raisins. I don't like them very much. Anyway, um, maybe that illustration doesn't work on all the raisin lovers out there. But anyway, um, the Bible says that we can't grow without being connected to him. And, and in doing so, we're connected to his church. You just dry up and wither. Um, we need... In this metaphor, we discover where the power to change comes from. And we all need to grow and change. And this comes through being connected to Christ. Number four, what about a member of a family? This is a beautiful one. Romans 8.16 says, we are God's children. When you're a baby born in a hospital, the most important thing for you is to have a family, a loved one or more than one person to go home with. Or you're really in a bad way. And that's the most important thing for us. And some of us as Christians, we've found Christ, but we haven't embedded in a family. Sometimes it's easy to jump from local community to local community, but I think it's healthiest to settle down and say, for better or worse, I'm going to stick with this group and I'm going to grow with them. And if you need to move town or you choose another church, that's great. But get engaged and be a part of that community and um, find God's purpose for you in the context of those around you. I want to leave you with this thought. Be good to those around you. Proverbs 27 verse 10 says, it's better to have a neighbour who is near than a brother who is far away. I was blessed to grow up in this community. I went to Macquarie College and knew many people from Walls End Church as great friends and family and, and um, went to Charlestown Church and we often did all kinds of things together with Newcastle Youth Church uniting us all in the region and it was a great place to grow up. I felt like I had hundreds of friends and then we moved to New Zealand where the only person I knew before I got there in the South Island was my boss who offered me the job, Lindsay Slight. And who here remembers Lindsay? Um, Lindsay was my first president and he gave me a go. And I went to Invercargill, South Island, New Zealand and didn't know a single person down there. And um, boy, when, you, when you're starting out brand new, um, it's, it's, it can be a bit tough. And, um, and you think about all your friends back home and you miss them. And the new friends don't seem the same as your old friends. And you think, I'll just try and find a new set like that set. But they just don't exist. You've just got to... And, and the, are you going to embrace the place where God's put you? And have you heard that saying, bloom where you're planted? Sometimes we're dreaming about being planted in a better garden bed somewhere else. But God's put you where you are, and that's your season for now. And God's inviting you to bloom where you're planted and connect with the people around you. And um, the Bible says it's better to have a neighbour who's near than a brother who's far away. And at a certain point on my journey, I had to say, look, I can still be long distance friends with those other people, but I've got to find people in the community around me. And growing up in this area, I had lots of people who were like me. But when I went to South Island, New Zealand, I couldn't find people like me. And this is where Christianity is amazing, because I ended up making friends with an unusual group of people, some people much older, some people much younger, different interests, some people who I, at first, I've got to admit, I just judged them and just thought they were weirdos. And some of these weirdos ended up becoming my best and most loyal friends. And some of them still contact me now, and they'll remember things that other other close people don't even remember. And it's amazing how God will bring people into your life who are different to you. Um, And he's got a special blessing for you for being good to the people around you. 
We're going to do something new at church that we've been toying with the idea for a while, and it's going to be led by uh, our deacons and deaconess team. And um, Bronwyn and Greg are leading those teams moving into this new season of nominating committee. And I'm going to just, um, you'll hear more about it over the next month or two. But we're going to um, create eight spaces within church here um, based on where the seats are. And um, the introverts right now are just thinking, what is this? I'm not, in, this doesn't sound good at all, but just relax. It's going to, no, you're not going to be forced to do anything. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to see how there's four panels of chairs. We're going to chop them in half down the middle, and that's going to be the eight sections. And what we want to do is we're just creating another capacity for us to connect as a community. And so what we want to encourage people to do is look out for the people in the rows that you sit around. And so I know that lots of you informally already do this, but the idea would be for the four, that block that you're a part of, um, we would plan a few things, like once a quarter, we'd do a special fellowship lunch just with your group of 30 or 40 people, and you'd have a lunch together and get to know each other a little more. Maybe once a year we'd do a working beat with just your group, and you'd come up to the church and wash the windows or something on a Sunday for two hours or something like that. But aside from that, on Sabbath, when you get together, the church is too big to know everyone. You know, sociologists uh, are, have different research. Some say that you can know up to 150 people. Others say up to 290 people. It's interesting that our church is in that bracket. But you can't, and, but they acknowledge that you can only really be close to about 5 to 15 people. You just can't be friends with everybody or close to everybody. But I'm encouraging you, God has put people in your life at work, at school, at preschool. God's put people in your life where your house is and your neighbours. And you don't have to be friends with everyone. But do reach out to the people who that God has put in the community around you. And so in a very practical sense, we're just going to try and facilitate that. And so we want to encourage everybody... You know, sometimes I'll be sitting over here and I'll look across the church and I'll, and I'll spot someone new and I think, I'd love to talk to that person. But I think, I bet there's no way I'm going to get to them before they wander out the door for the, at the end of the service because it's just too big of a room. And, you know, I end up connecting and chatting with a few other people and, and they've gone and I've missed the opportunity to say hello. And, um, but if we recognise that we've got little groups within our larger group, then we can say, hey, that person has never sat on my row before. I will usually sit in the, roughly the same spot. I'm going to say hello to them and invite them to stay for lunch today. Or you also, the opposite might be true. You're sitting there and you think, hey, so-and-so always sits on our row and they're away today. I wonder if they're sick or if something's wrong. I'm going to send them a text and say, I missed you today. This is not just something that our deacons will do. It's something that we can all do to look out for one another. How does that sound? It's going to be something that we'll just grow into as a church. If you just if it doesn't spin your wheels and you think oh, I'm going to ignore that, that's fine. But we're going to try and be nice to you, especially if you sit near us. Now you might be thinking, well, what if I want to be friendly to somebody who doesn't sit near me? We're well, not allowed to be. <laughs> Only kidding. You can do whatever you want. You can sit wherever you want. You don't have to stay in the same section. Do whatever you like. But I want to encourage us to look out for each other. And particularly, this is one way, as we grow as a church, um, we need to be a little strategic about making sure that we connect with one another. And um, that's a little practical way of doing it. I'm looking forward to Bronwyn and Greg going to introduce more of what that's going to look like over the next month or two. Um, I want to have a prayer with you. We've looked at four different ways that God calls us a church family. And um, I want to encourage you to take that next step with connecting with not only Jesus, but with one another. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a great God you are and we love you. Thank you that you want us to know that love between us. Thanks for the illustration of the string that reminds us that we are stronger when we're together. Some of us are longing for a few strings, but there's something holding us back, and we don't have the, friend, the close friends we're longing for. And I pray for a breakthrough there. And um, sometimes the, the work's got to be done on our end, and sometimes we just need a miracle. We need a special person to come along into our life, and I pray for all of those miracles to take place. Some of us need to connect more on the level of 
making a commitment to church itself to say, yes, I want to contribute, I want to receive, I want to give, I want to be a part of this community at a deeper level. And I pray that you'd bless us and help us to see what that next step is, whether it's becoming more committed to a Sabbath school group or a small group or serving in a ministry or now this new idea of having these eight different areas to connect in church. Help us to take all these opportunities. Um, and be good to those who are around us, to bloom where we're planted. Thank you for bringing good people into my life in New Zealand who were so different to me. And thank you that you treat us all as equals and that um, that's the beauty of the gospel, that you will unite people who would never normally be united. Help us to be open to having important and meaningful relationships with people who are different to us. And may your spirit break through those barriers in our community. So I pray that you would bless us, help us to love you more and love one another and be recognised that we are disciples of Jesus for how we love. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.